All right, so it looks like we're starting with Irvin with uh, hiding your command and control in the discussions. In yeah, the this, uh, this piece of malware has multiple checks to hide itself from tools so that it can't be uh, deconstructed. And it seems to be using uh, YouTube and uh, encrypting, or not encrypting, just encoding Base64 stuff uh, to its CNC server in, in descriptions mm -hmm. as a way to, to not only hide from everybody so you can't, you can't put it in a sandbox and see what it's up to, but when it works, it's, it's communicating out through YouTube. Oh, yeah. And you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the, uh, the attack framework, and I see it's here. Um, let me drag this loose. Come on. There we are. This is the uh, MITRE attack framework, and here's their write-up on Astaroth. Mm -hmm. So they've been at it since 2017, and they list all their techniques and stuff. That's why I'm really getting into this thing. I'll bring it up more later. But anyway, the uh, – yep, come on. Oh, it's the wrong browser. That's why. Anyway, all right. <laughs> so there's a bunch of encoded data. That does not look like Base64, some kind of custom yeah, encoding. The one above is the one – the picture above. Yeah. That's in the description. The, yeah, but I noticed this. That looks base 64 -y. Yeah. But this looks like some, every other letter is N or O. That looks like some uh, interesting custom encoding. Right. Yeah, it's, cool. It's a encrypted message, yeah. I do a lot of CTFs where they have like codings like that. <laughs> and so Google with cross-site scripting. Yeah, Google had a nice little cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability recently uh, with their Google Voice application, uh, or extension, I should say. So if you installed the Google Voice extension, uh, it would look for phone numbers in your Gmail. And if it found a phone number, it would you know, do its magic and make it you know, easy to click, and, and, you can get, um, and you can call the person really quickly. Well, instead of a phone number, you could have any number and then add something like an image tag afterwards and it would totally take that and, and create an image tag and you could do XSS right in, in Google Mail, which is fantastic. Um, and I mean, I could just imagine what you could do with this. I, 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 could you send someone an email, for example, with like a fake phone number and then, uh, you know, have extra, you know, JavaScript tacked onto the end? Could you use something like the Google ad IDs to, to inject things that look like phone numbers into pages and then have the cross site scripting worked. I mean, there's so many possibilities with this that could have been exploited, but it wasn't exploited. And at the bottom, it says the guy got three thousand dollars as a reward for finding this pretty serious bug. He did. Yeah, which I, three thousand yeah. is not enough. No, well, that's I, not enough. Yeah, no, I think that would be awesome. You could steal Google cookies and get in people's yeah. Google accounts, which is yeah. you totally could. I mean, this this seems like a really big deal and Google's like here's three thousand dollars like so we should clearly go find an old version of that extension and practice playing with it that's that's neat yeah all right cool so uh then i've got oh yeah i i'm the only one that seems to like coronavirus articles so i've been very interested as usual and um so i'm very impressed by san francisco i'm glad i live here i mean Deaths remain at 35 for the whole thing in San Francisco, which is mind-boggling. We got a lot of people here and a lot of businesses, and we've really done a great job. And I, I remember I went by the hospital a few weeks ago, and there was nobody there. And, and hospitals are just quiet because we only have like 60 people in the hospital. It's crazy. And they're planning to get to no more than six cases a day. And this is now the fourth day with not a single death. So we're really doing a good job here. So that's why we're going to open up. 95% of businesses are opening up on Monday. And they're watching carefully. So I'm very impressed and I hope they continue to do a good job so we can actually resume something sort of like normal life. Um, and Berkeley, I, I think this is awesome. Berkeley is going to close the streets so the restaurants can have everybody sit outside. That's what I wanted to do. Go back to Phil's and sit outside. And they, they figured that out. So I, they say San Francisco might do it, but the San Francisco government is so uh, Byzantine that they probably can't get anything through. But it sounds like a great idea just close the streets and have everybody put tables spaced out on, out in the open air. Sounds awesome. So Unless it's be, a really hot day. Yeah, it'll be fun. Well, you'll have all summer. There's no reason to have everybody indoors. Just put a couple umbrellas out there. Everybody will be happy. 
probably not great if you're disabled and uh, <laughs> well, I, to... even better when I used to take care of a disabled guy, we would eat outside because he could run his wheelchair up on the, uh, on the sidewalk and yeah, often but... inside had stairs or something. So just having an outside table was perfect for him. If they can get down there with no streets. So parking lots are going to be filled up. Well, yeah, there's all that, but yeah. Anyway, so this is the amazing statistic that a lot of people have been quoting. If you look at the United States, this is the, um, our number of cases went up and it's just staying up and up. And now we're just going to open more states and have it go up further. And so, you know, as you know, we have more than 80,000 people dead and more than a million infected. And this is um, South Korea. They had a spike. They tamped it down within a couple of weeks. And now it's down to nothing, nine cases and a total of 260 deaths, which is just amazing. 260 deaths there, 86,000 here. And so, I bet we're talking about the entirety of the United States versus South Korea, which is tiny. It is, but it's still there by per capita and everything. They did much better than us. Yeah. Although uh, I had another article, I guess I didn't get it here, where they talk about the culture of South Korea and how it is people are under incredible pressure. And they're also under huge pressure to obey the rules and to conform and succeed. And they say now they're starting to have outbreaks because people are getting infected in the gay nightclubs and they totally discriminate against gay people because that's the hard part. If you have a place where people obey the rules, then there's always some underclass that is disapproved of and hiding. And over there, it's gay people. And I think that's the big thing over here. Over here, we have a huge underclass of like illegal immigrants and Uber drivers and the people that man restaurants and meatpacking and and all kinds of people who have no health care, live in crowded conditions, live hand to mouth and can't possibly knock off work for a couple of days. And so that's what makes it really spread is your discriminated class. Anyway, um, so I thought it was interesting stuff. So basically what you're saying is that uh, we should end discrimination. Yes, I think the, uh, the social justice warriors, and this is what Gandhi said, we have a huge issue. You shouldn't have some class of people that you treat like dirt, or it's going to come back and hurt you all. And a disease is one of the many ways why having, you know, like 10 or 20% of people that you just treat like dirt comes back to you. If we had just basic socialized medicine and enough social safety nets so everybody had a reasonable lifestyle, we'd be a lot better off. And people might be loyal enough to obey government orders instead of just rebelling against everything. Anyway, so um, most exploited bugs I've heard this years ago from Rapid7, and I guess it's still the same. Just a yep. few, uh, it's old bugs that people haven't patched, right? That are easy to exploit. That's correct. A lot of this stuff has been out there in the wild, out in the open for a while. We've known that we need to make patches. Uh, surprise, surprise. A lot of it is uh, exploits against Microsoft products. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Patch your stuff. Well, you know, the thing I've thought about this is this really should make room for managed security providers, which I, there was a guy in San Francisco doing this. I mean, obviously, it's too difficult for most companies to figure out how to keep their stuff patched, and they would gladly pay a month. There was a guy that came and uh, talked at the college and was recruiting students to work for him that says charges like, 15 bucks a day per employee, and he will just take care of everything. He will buy the equipment, install it, update it, and manage your email and security for you. And I think a lot of people would cheerfully pay for that. That's what I've been saying for the last couple of years, and I think it's, uh, I think that that's only becoming more and more the case, especially with, uh, with the current situation where, um, you know, it's, it's getting, I think that cybersecurity budgets are coming under scrutiny, even though maybe now more than ever companies need protection so i think that if you can um have a uh quantifiable um you know amount like that where you know you're spending x amount for employee and it makes it easier to justify so. yeah yeah i think it's going to be the wave of the future and i'm just looking yep and once again uh that is in the attack matrix there's the China 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 China. China. Everything we talk about, they, they've got here. It's uh, pretty interesting. Anyway, all right. And then we got uh, these guys selling access. Okay. Yeah, there's a store out there, Magbo, mm -hmm. where you can buy in bulk or specific accounts uh, for pretty much anything. There's a 
a chart down at the bottom that kind of shows out the top products, 90% being web shell access. And you have CMS panel, FTP credentials, and other. Yep, that makes sense. I've heard of these for a long time, that you can buy machines inside every corporation, and you can pay more. And at one time, they would even give you a free trial of a machine inside any corporation. Mm -hmm. It makes total sense because it's so easy to infect them. And it's yeah. so hard to protect them. That's why, you know, defense is the most difficult part. Yep. And Adobe Reader, for crying out loud. This Again. Is, this has been like, <laughs> Again. like, for like 20 years. <laughs> so, so if you are, for whatever reason, really a Adobe Reader on Mac OS, I have some bad news for you. Again, <laughs> the, there's ways to escalate to root with, uh, Adobe Reader, uh, mostly having to do with the updater and the updater not being properly sandboxed. I noticed this is the thing on a lot of the Mac OS Adobe products, like in the lab that we were at school, uh, Sam, I was digging around on the computers, surprise, surprise, and we have a bunch of Adobe products installed and they're all like have sticky root stuff and all have like root permission. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. what's going on here? And, it's, like, uh, it's like nine years that one of my students was hired by the Adobe security team to clean it up. And I said, man, I don't have to congratulate you or give you sympathy. Because yeah, well, the first apparently, generation of security people, they just throw them under the bus saying, look, how about you patch it by like next week without changing anything, okay? And then after yeah. a year of that, they have to admit, you know, we have to rewrite all this stuff completely. Well, well, well clearly your, your teaching's not... <laughs> <laughs> hasn't rubbed too much off on, on Adobe yet uh, yeah. because, yeah, so the reader has another uh, root vulnerability. So you can essentially trick the updater into giving you root permissions on uh, any Mac OS with Adobe Reader installed. Well, well, about five years ago, they did claim they were putting it in a sandbox, isolating from other processes, but it sounded like a step in the right direction, but maybe they didn't do that for the Mac version. Well, they didn't. They certainly did not do it correctly for the updater. Yeah. <laughs> well, the updater is a very common flaw in Mac. Something about the Mac update process really annoys people. Yep. And in fact, that's how Apple lost their no virus thing. They had no viruses and then they blocked Adobe updates to make them wait six weeks for the Mac official update. And that's how they got a uh, worm through, I think, Flash. Hmm. So there's been a, an unsolved problem there about Mac updates all along. By the way, my Mac is always bugging me, prompting me for updates, which I never put on. Because they just break everything. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so. All right. And then I, this one here, I was reluctant to even read this because I've learned that Forbes is like a pretty much fake news place. Because you can just, it's just people, bloggers posting random stuff. They don't vet it at all. That's what I found. So they often have completely false stories, but there's a few good people on Forbes. And I looked up this guy and he seems more or less real. So the clickbait headline annoyed me, but he's a financial projector. And his point, of course, is that um, everybody has lost their attack parameter. Everybody has, uh, they used to have everything in company resources, now they're all at home using God knows what, which, you know, I'm not sure that's true because they used to be traveling using coffee houses everywhere. But anyway, um, what I thought was interesting is you can invest in cybersecurity. There's a cybersecurity exchange traded fund. And of course it's going up like mad. <laughs> and uh, here's cyber stocks, Fortinet and Palo Alto. Uh, going up a lot. So I thought that's that's actually a pretty good idea. Investing in cybersecurity is not a bad plan at all, I would think. And it gets every attack comes and then it jumps up. So if you didn't get to buy Zoom, uh, you might look for cybersecurity stocks to invest in. All right. And then we got WeChat, which Liz sent me and I went and found the original article from Citizen Lab here. Yeah. Uh, so I thought it was behind a paywall. Yeah, I thought I thought this was pretty interesting uh, in terms of um, you know the research they did on WeChat, which is uh, for those who don't know, WeChat's an application that you pretty much need to do anything in China, uh, whether that's uh, talk to people or um, pay for your food or um, access Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi networks while you're over there. Yeah, we all had to get it. What's that? Yeah, we all had to get it in China. Yeah. You yeah. can't do anything without it. And it was hard to get in. But at that time, you couldn't even get in unless five people already had it would like recommend you. That's hmm. right. 
And uh, they're still very, um, it's still very easy to get kicked off their platform for no reason, especially if you don't have enough uh, Chinese WeChat friends. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one thing I thought was, I noticed was very interesting. Um, the last time we went over there was that uh, when I fired up the app, it offered me an option to authenticate with a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. um, and Great. It made me <laughs> curious about whether there are any partnerships between uh, Facebook and Tencent, who is uh, the the um, company that owns uh, WeChat. So this was an interesting, I thought this was some really interesting research. Uh, these researchers looked into uh, the way that surveillance is performed within uh, the WeChat app, and uh, especially with regard to censorship. And um, one thing I thought was interesting about this is that uh, the <laughs> government, the Chinese government censors, um, you know, they say that um, international users aren't censored for uh, WeChat or anything like that. But um, the uh, censors at WeChat have kind of honed in on the fact that um, uh, taboo, taboo, uh, 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 let's let's say a, a contraband information <laughs> is going to be coming from um, international users a lot of the time. So they found it to be the most efficient uh, avenue to to uh, look at any media files that are coming from uh, international users or messages or anything like that for certain keywords. And also uh, they will check the file hashes of certain um, like image documents or whatever to see to make sure you're not sending a, a, a political cartoon that they don't agree with or whatever but I thought that this was really interesting and one one thing that also really surprised me uh, and and it was in the um, it was in the original article which uh, like you said it had a pay uh, had a paywall and um, and you actually pay for this thing the Wall Street Journal uh, I uh, circumvent the paywall. In ah, ah. <laughs> right. you know, the hacking is wrong, Liz. <laughs> yeah. No, I do not pay, but I do access their articles. Oh, <laughs> goodness. oh we're going to have to bleep that out. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna have to. <laughs> You're going to do some video editing, Sam. I need to, you need to censor. You need to censor. Uh, do a little censorship yourself. Um, so what? one thing I thought was interesting about I that never say anything bad. was that uh, last year um, U.S. officials uh, ordered uh, Beijing Kunlun Tech Company to sell uh, Grindr, which is a gay dating app. And I, I had no idea, first of all, that Grindr was owned by a Chinese media company. Well, That's they wanted to buy it and they were blocked by the government eventually. That would be awesome. They could totally blackmail all the politicians that are secretly that's gay. That's exactly why the government. Exactly everybody Republican, I think. <laughs> that's why the that's why the government ordered them to sell it because they said it was risky. Um, you know that grinders collecting all this personal data, and then they could use it to blackmail people with security clearances. Now, oh, yeah. I'm not sure how you could force the sale of a. Uh, uh, an app that's owned by a, a, a foreign company, but I didn't, you know, go down the rabbit hole on that one and see how it panned out, but I thought that was kind of interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. I read about that at the time. Yeah, that's good stuff. And then we got um, targeting semantic web gateway. So what is semantic web gateway? Is this a hardware or software? I think it's a, a software. So you build, you put this to protect your whole company, like a layer seven firewall? Yeah, something like that. So the Mirai, there's a Mirai variant that targets uh, semantics web secure, or yeah, secure web gateway. But it became end of life in 2015. So if you're still yeah, using it, you're probably asking for it. Yeah. And I mean, you know, businesses don't always update because there's the new, there's a new vendor. If it, you know, like their mindset is if it ain't broke, don't fix it, even though it is broken, but whatever, right? So what did they do? Just DOS it or did they find something else to do to it? It's a variant of a malware that already exists. Yeah. 
that they just made some changes to and and it works as an RCE. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, they got RCE. Oh, they did get RCE. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So that means they should be able to what? Add malware to web pages you view? Basically. That would be awesome. Yeah, neat. All right. And uh, wow, yeah, this one is pretty awesome. Huawei, you know, well, you know you're onto something when they lie about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I, I don't know what's going on at this point. So, um, yeah, that's the polite way of saying they're lying. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, a Huawei employee uh, added some code to the Linux kernel, and you can view the code down if you scroll down, Sam. So, the Linux kernel? Yeah, this is. I thought everything Linux. had to go through Linus. Did Linus clear it? It did no. It, I don't know if it got cleared or not. But um, but this is the code that they tried adding. Uh, uh, look at so oh, if you look at the state time. proc, seven seven seven. So that means that the that this process that controls the state of the Linux kernel, uh, or this Linux processes and whatnot, uh, has a complete read and write permissions uh, that anyone can access. Yeah, I always look for that in CTFs. Find the seven 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 file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is a process <laughs> in memory that's linked to the Linux kernel. Fantastic. And so this is like the like it, they're not even like hiding it. Like I remember when I, when I was making malware for the Google Store, which was all all okay. I wasn't doing anything bad. It was for um, a red team. Yeah, a red team thing. Uh, I, I really tried to hide my bugs. You know oh, that I was. You know, bugs. I love a POC that's this big. That's a good sign. Yeah, 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 no, but this is just like, no, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to make this like a <laughs> very obvious, uh, and, you know, just throw in like, there's going to be uh, read and write well by everybody. And so, of course, you got caught right away. And the person was connected. They found out that the person was connected to Huawei. And now Huawei is saying, no, we, well, why would this person do this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but how can you put something in the kernel? That's that messed up without somebody catching you. Because GitHub, they they did catch them. That's how it. So they put it on. It became news. They didn't they actually get it in the kernel. They proposed to put it in the kernel. They, well, they proposed, yeah. Okay. Right. It, it's not in the wild. It's not something you can. Okay. You can they try to get it in. Somebody spotted it and say, "Hey, what the heck is going on?" And they're like, yeah, oh, and then, yeah, it turns this out person, that, we don't yeah, know this person. Yeah. 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 And kind of, wash our hands on this. Stuff that Linus got in trouble for screaming and swearing about too much to where he went to like therapy to try to be less crazed about this kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> Huawei, uh, an employee of Huawei and Huawei has plausible deniability, so that totally means they're involved. Um, well, you know, for some unknown reason, the United States government doesn't want us using Huawei stuff. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. It's it's like their stuff is crap, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so this one I thought was interesting just because they targeted the air gap network. And of course I was interested in the, um, the attack framework part of this. So down here, they're going to target an air gap thing. So they used Tropic Trooper and now they made malware that infects USBs when you plug them in. So when you put the USB across the air gap and infects the next machine. So I thought that was interesting. And, um, if I can figure out how to operate my computer. Um, there. And this, so the name of this thing was about China Chopper. What was it? Um, Tropic Trooper. And what I thought is interesting is if you look up Tropic Trooper here in groups, um, and I can't operate my computer. Okay. There. Um, You've got it from these guys, and there it is, Tropic Trooper. And if you look at them, they're also Keyboy, which is interesting because one thing that is not here is using USB sticks. It's not one of their known techniques, so they're going to have to add that. There is a technique, like infecting USB sticks, which was not previously associated with these guys, but I guess it will be added. So anyway, it's good, clean fun to like keep track of these people and get used to who they are and what they're doing a USB ferry malware and so on. Anyway, not that this is a terribly new technique because we used it against Iran, but I'm interested in watching as the ability of security people to document techniques and groups is getting pretty good. Anyway, and uh, then we've got NSO, notorious yeah. NSO. Back at it again. So uh, I thought this is pretty interesting. Essentially, they were trying to 
sell a rebranded uh, version of Pegasus to uh, police departments in the U.S. And, uh, and uh, yeah, San Diego police were all about it, but they decided not to get it because it was too expensive. Turn your smartphone into an intelligence gold mine, which it totally is. Yeah. Uh, you know, and reading articles like this just make me want to, like, get rid of all my tech and go live in a cave, but that's not going to happen. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Well, I, you saw the Google opt-out village, right? I mean, that's where you go. Yeah. So I do think that it's good. Uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate... Um, journalists like this that are making people aware of what's going on uh oh, yeah. and, and it's it is kind of interesting to note that it's just a big shell game they're marketing this app as something else but it's really just pegasus and in the past they've said oh well you know pegasus can be used to target u.s devices uh but that's really not true facebook sued nso recently and uh one of the things that came out in the lawsuit was how they're using all these U.S. servers uh, in their in their work, and I, I mean, it's just it's, it's pretty interesting. Oh, it is, it is, and they, uh, you know, it's not clear what the law is, and they've been lying and claiming that they don't even know people are using it in the country, and then they show, well, in fact, they're using your cloud services. You can totally see them connecting from these banned countries into your cloud. So right. I think these guys are very much like uh, weapons dealers. Oh, they're absolutely just like weapons dealers. I mean, they're, uh, and it's interesting because there's, they're an Israeli company and like, for example, they make all, all the Saudi spyware and sell it to the Saudi government. And um, I, I just think it's very interesting. You know, we do need to get some, some uh, more specific laws on this stuff because uh as as one quote from this article uh mentions you know abuse isn't it's not a likelihood it's a certainty uh you know yeah this is this is one of those things where if you're if you just turn it the police loose on it and you don't require warrants or anything like that there's gonna there's gonna be an issue well i mean and this is a huge problem like if you if you expand to a nation like china you actually have to obey chinese law and if you have objections to Chinese law, tough. I mean, so one of my students worked 10 years ago installing radar dishes in Bahrain. And they told him, these are in case we get attacked by an enemy fleet, but put them on the edge of the country and turn them around pointing into the country, not out over the water. <laughs> so he said, oh, I don't think these things are actually what using used for what they said they were going to use them for. <laughs> right. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, one, one thing that happened is that, uh, this was fairly recently, it's mentioned in the article, is that a, uh, a, an NSO employee actually um, abused, uh, ab abused uh, Pegasus to target a, uh, a love interest. In fact, I'll, I should, should have included that link, but I'll drop it in the chat okay. here. In case yeah, I think wants. I saw that one. Yeah. Um, um, which is you know, that's, of course, a common thing, but... Uh, right. Uh, I believe last week... Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe it was you uh, or Irvin, I can't remember, but you had the yeah. story about the um, contact tracing app that had been used to stalk a lady. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's just the, just, just the written log at the restaurant of everybody eating here. They use yeah. it to stalk people. Oh, yeah. You know, any kind of list of people creates this abuse option. Right. So... Interesting things to, to be aware of. Yeah, and that's how you end up, I think, with the American system where you have these armed people protesting the coronavirus lockdowns. It's, it's the good and the bad side of America. Everybody has so much civil liberties that nobody can tell them what to do. So sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. Yeah, though, and, and also, you know, the, the, the way that the, the vague nature of, of what laws make it uh, sometimes it makes it better for the citizens and sometimes it makes it worse because it, it, the ambiguity leaves uh, the door open for uh, overzealous prosecution in some respects. Yes, so. it does. That's why I remember one of my Chinese patriotic students said, you know, in America, there's no sense of community, of sticking together, you know, of working for the common good. And that's largely true. We're very individualistic and it is a strength and a weakness. Yeah. All right. Any more comments?
Nope. I'm going to stop the recording then.